Bishop here is one of the retirees. Okay. So one okay. Well, good morning. I will call our February meeting of Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority to order. Uh, several items from the chairman. One is recognition of uh, one of our retirees, so if you'll excuse me, I'll come down front. Is this on now? Good. Um, we were supposed to have three retirees, but we, we've just got the best one here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll introduce him first, Richard Bishop. Uh, Richard's operation manager position is like the quarterback uh, for operations. He's been, I guess, 16 years with Embark and uh, started as a road supervisor and, and uh, has worked uh, with Embark and wanted to find him on the weekend or holiday, the place it was most likely to be was at the operations centers. So you actually are going to retire. I have. Oh, you have? Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, we've got a little plaque that in recognition of your 16 years of service. And uh, I want to congratulate you and thank you on the part of the Embark Board and all the administration for your many years of service. I know you want to say something, but I've got two questions for you that I always ask retirees. Okay. What was the best thing about Embark, and what was something that could be improved upon? Um, the best thing that I've noticed in our 16 years of service is that this organization, it supplies a very, um, there's a big need for what they do, okay? And they do a real good job of supplying that need. And if I would do anything different, if you asked me that, I wouldn't do anything different. This, uh, this organization <clears throat> uh, does a very good job at providing a service, and what they really need is a mission. If you give them a mission and give them a little bit of resources and just get out of their way, they'll take care of it. Well, I think you hit upon it right there, resources. We need more money, don't we? <laughs> okay. So, all right. Well, congratulations. Thank you very Thank much. You. items from the chairman uh, and I'm going to let uh, Jason but we've got a new amalgamated transit union president that is here today and, and let uh, Jason just say uh, introduce him in a couple brief words about his history. Thank you chairman. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Burke. Uh, he's joined us uh, this morning and He's the newly elected president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, effective uh, January. So just took over his uh, responsibilities. And um, uh, before that, Chris has been with us for 25 years. Um, spent all kinds of time uh, as, a, as a mechanic working on uh, the buses, uh, making sure the service we put out on the street that Mr. Bishop mentioned we're able to do. Um, and <clears throat> was one of the few few mechanics that had all six ASE certifications. I think maintained them for a long time, so not an easy task. And I just say one of the things I appreciated about Chris or appreciate about him, um, he was always the one that worked with our new hires in terms of familiarizing them with a 40-foot heavy-duty transit bus, making sure they could could do a successful pre-trip. And so. 
Chris, looking forward to working with you in your new role, and we appreciate you coming to the meeting uh, this morning. Thank you. Are you are you still working? I mean, this it or is this a full time job? Full time, full time union president. You full time union president. Okay. If you'd like to say a word to us, we'd appreciate I'd it. Just like to, you know, like I said, like Jason said, I've been with the company 25 years. This is a new job for me, so I've got big shoes to fill. You know, our uh, outgoing president was Omega Robinson. You guys know him. He was here 30 years. So this is new for me. But I'm uh, eager to work with you guys any way I can. Anything I can do to help you, just let me know. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Then also, we've got a brief presentation by M&A Architects on some of our transit center improvements. Justin Mitchell, if you wouldn't speak into the microphone and, uh, and just brief us on it. Good morning, members of the Trust. We're going to talk about um, some of the improvements we're doing at the transit center uh, that is on Hudson in between 4th and 5th Street. As part of this project, we uh, have been asked to look at the paving inside the transit center and recommend repairs. We've been asked to add additional water access for the bus uh, drop-off areas. We've been asked to update the landscaping to meet current city standards. And we've been asked to do a dumpster enclosure, repair some failing roof snow guards, and then Look at the site, existing signage. When the uh, station was designed, it was Metro Transit. Many of the, much of the signage for the station is actually sandblasted into the walls. So look at recommendations for how to um, cover or bring the signage up to your current standards. And so as we kind of look at the scope, we're going to kind of start from the ground and kind of go to more, uh, go kind of up. And so as we look at it, we've kind of located the uh, problem paving areas. They're kind of highlighted in red there. We've also looked at adding water locations in the map over here on the site. Um, they're located in the blue. And then as we looked at the landscaping, we saw some areas along 4th Street, which you see at the bottom of this plan. And we saw that the trees were planted too close to the transit uh, covers, and so we've pulled them out towards the street to align with the landscaping that goes down 4th Street. And because of that, we're going to have a little bit of gas line relocation as we move through there. So then coming up from that, from that major work, the groundwork, we start looking at how we're going to beautify the site with landscaping. We um, look to the city for standards on landscaping and are matching their Project 180 landscaping, which kind of is unifying the whole downtown area. So as you can see here, kind of uh, illustrious landscaping plan to your left, and then the planting palette and hardscape material palette that we're going to put in the existing landscape areas around the site. Then we kind of jump to the west side of the site. If you look at the plan, the area highlighted in red is your current um, dumpster location. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, you can see a picture of the existing dumpster location. It currently has a CMU wall facing the transit center and then is open to the alley. As, because of that, it's become a place for people to shelter overnight, um, and, it's, and it's become kind of unsanitary because of that. So we are looking to enclose it with some fencing to allow for security of the area, but also allow for some visibility for the staff users that are actually taking trash out there. So we have some options for fencing. We, you can kind of see in the pictures along the top. We've currently went to the uh, design review committee with a uh, metal fence, and we're just trying to make final decisions with you guys about how you want to screen this area. Then we kind of go up to the roof. You uh, had existing snow guards on the uh, bronze roof panels along the edge. And um, over time, how they had, were adhered to the roof has failed and has removed some of the finish of the panels. And so we're actually taking a retrofit product that's a little bit larger. And we're going to mechanically fasten those to the roof so that you'll have new snow guards to hold any ice that accumulates on the roof as, as winter goes through. Then we started looking at the building signage. 
On the sides of the building, as you can see in the picture in the upper left-hand corner, there is a metro transit, and it is sandblasted into the wall. So what we've decided to do there is we've been asked to incorporate a touchscreen, transit map, uh, interactive kiosk, and then we're actually building out the wall a little bit and attaching aluminum panels to it to kind of uh, align with the feel of driving and things like that. Part of the idea for these panels is that some of them are perforated and that we would put lights behind them so at night it would give added additional light for people to come into the building and kind of create some artwork along the space. This idea kind of came from the, the middle picture you see there, the, the old phone booth and how they used to actually provide those holes to, in the shape of the phone to give people an idea of it's a phone in there. Um, as part of that, we're also looking at your existing doors. They swing open in high winds and we're going to install some stainless steel bollards that match the ones that are shown in the lower right to help as a windbreak in that area. Then along the site, there are many, I, I believe, 21 site signage walls that are existing. And they, there's a picture of one up in the, up in the upper left-hand corner. It, um, people generally lean on them as they come in. Many of the cast stone blocks kind of along the top band are removed among many of them. And they're sandblasted with the existed, existing Metro Transit logos. So, as we went through the site, we actually pinpointed different ones, and we have three options that we are looking for all over the site. Um, most of them that align with a transit area where people wait, we're actually cutting down the wall and installing a bench seat to create more seating there. Um, the ones that are at the corners and entries, we're actually looking at this red one here, and it, we're actually fixing a new sign and then removing and replacing the cast stone cap. And then other walls that are around landscaping beds but aren't a place where people could wait and don't really need signage are getting an art panel that would al align with the panels we are sticking on the side of the building at the interactive kiosk. So it would be perforated with a uh, skyline of the city and just be an art panel so people can't walk into the landscaping. So as part of this project, we estimate the value of the construction cost of the improvements to be $365,000 about. And our current schedule is to complete all the construction documents um, this month and then go for all approvals next month, bid in April, and award the contract with construction work starting on site in the fall. I'd like to thank you guys for letting me present to you and just if you have any questions. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Uh, I think this is uh, a very good idea. Uh, the, uh, the center is, is okay, but you can't say too much more than just okay about its current conditions. And I really think this will be create a more inviting uh, environment or atmosphere for the users of the transit system. So thank you. I think it looks great. I think it'll really add a lot to uh, the appearance and, and the welcoming uh, of, of users. So thank you. Thank you. Jason, how old did you say it was? I was just shocked. 13? Yeah, Transit Center's 13 years old. and. Um, you can imagine the amount of volume and traffic that that facility sees every day and in my mind it's it's remarkable it's still in as good a condition as it's in I think it's credit to the staff that takes care of the facility on a daily basis but definitely time for a little bit of a facelift um, the uh, other thing I might mention is that the funding for the project will come from uh, federal grant funds uh, for uh, capital improvement projects That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank I have, you. I'm sorry, I have a quick question. And I want to double down on what the councilman said. This is really smart, and it seems like a really good investment in our branding and the infrastructure. I'm curious how you arrived. You all arrived at the, uh, the fencing around the, the dumpster, which, of course, I think is important. Why metal over the wood? When I was looking at those uh, images you put up there, um, 
of the different fencing options, the wood almost sort of uh, seemed like it fit more in with the trees that you're wrapping around in this sort of way. It seems very organic, whereas the metal might seem a little not so welcoming. I'm just kind of curious how you all arrived at that decision. Am I totally wrong? I'm just thinking aesthetically here and the welcoming kind of aspect of it. So. Well, it was more a function of that we wanted to make sure that there was security for the um, the staff that actually goes and, and uses the dumpster because people are sheltering there and using it for unsanitary conditions. We didn't want, we wanted a situation where somebody could safely look into the dumpster enclosure from the alley before entering it to make sure that they're not interrupting something or putting themselves in danger. So it was more of visibility and then just trying to find a nice product that would uh, allow that visibility. Thank you. Thanks again for all the work you're doing. All right, thank you. All right, do we have any citizens to be heard? If not, I would have a motion to approve our minutes unless any of the trustees have any changes to the minutes of last month's meeting. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Consent docket, we only have two items on the consent docket. Uh, unless there's a question by any of the trustees on those two items, then I would have a motion to approve our consent docket. All in favor? God bless you. Uh, consent docket, we have two items. Approval of a lease agreement uh, retroactive to February 1st for retail space at the Santa Fe Depot. Uh, Jason, you want to? Sure, I can talk about that. Uh, and oh, that's, oh, excuse me. I'm, you're right, that okay. consent. I'm, uh, Approval of a contract amendment with ETC Institute for Market Research Services. I was looking above. <laughs> Understandable. Okay. We have such an unusually short agenda yeah. today. So uh, the uh, contract uh, amendment with ETC is uh, for additional services uh, related to the Hispanic market survey that we're uh, wanting to do. And if you'll uh, recall, the, the board approved a contract with ETC back in August of 2015. It was a four-year contract. And what ETC is helping us do is they're doing an annual customer survey. They're doing um, a non-rider survey every other year. They're working on a couple of niche surveys for us that we have not uh, done before, one of them being a downtown commuter uh, survey and then the survey uh, for um, our Hispanic community. What we've discovered is that um, our Hispanic community is underrepresented in our um, existing ridership and so we feel like we certainly want to uh, survey that community, figure out the best ways to communicate, try to learn what kind of, kind of amenities are important uh, to, to that group and uh, be able to offer um, transit services. So as we were working through the uh, survey tool with ETC, they had actually recommended subcontracting with a local uh, Hispanic public uh, relations firm to help us not only refine the survey tool, but also to help us do uh, some focus groups and some analysis once the research was complete. So. Um, with that, uh, the increase is about $11,800, taking the cost of the uh, Hispanic market community survey from $13,000 to $24,800. But again, thinking this is our first opportunity to really um, try to understand uh, that area of the market, we, we think it's certainly be beneficial in the long run. All right. Any questions? Then I have a motion to approve item A. All in favor? Opposed? Item B is approval of a request for proposal for parking operations and management and to authorize the administrators to advertise and release an RFP. Uh, you do have an amended RFP um, at your desk, which I think they pulled the parking meter operations out of the original RFP. But um, Jason, if you'd like to speak to that a minute. Correct. The, uh the scope of work for the RFP that was passed out today is the one that will be released through BidSync, the electronic uh, bid management system. 
And uh, just as a, as a reminder, uh, the existing contract that we have for operations and facilities management services for our parking garages uh, is set to uh, expire in June of this year. Our current contract is with Republic Parking. We entered into a three-year agreement with them in 2012 with two one-year renewals. And of course, we're at the end of coming up on the end of that second renewal. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in developing this RFP, as you'll recall, back in August of last year, uh, the board entered into an agreement with Chance Management Advisors. Uh, Chance Management is a uh, consultant that is um, assisting us with a, a couple of main things. One is an independent audit of our uh, off-street parking operations. And we also tasked uh, Chance Management with helping us develop an RFP and new contract in anticipation of uh, knowing that we were going to need to bid these services, or I should say, uh, release a proposal for these um, services. So with that, um, looking through the RFP, you'll notice that um, it's very similar to uh, the existing um, expectations we have with our current provider. Um, we have emphasized a couple of areas, though, in this uh, RFP. One is the experience of the general manager or the management team that will actually be assigned on site um, here in Oklahoma City. Um, as you look through the RFP, you will also see uh, some requirements for staffing, some requirements for uh, budgetary and financial controls. And in particular, you're going to see a lot of detail with regards to expectations of the contractor in the areas of facilities maintenance. So uh, we believe the scope is a little bit more detailed than maybe what we used the last time. But we think it's uh, really going to help us um, uh, be able to manage that contract a little bit more effectively. Uh, the last thing I would mention about the RFP is um, the arrangement is similar to the arrangement we have currently with Republic in that is we're basically asking for proposals on a expense reimbursement basis. So we would essentially reimburse the operator for the expenses incurred with operating the garages. And then um, in addition to that, the proposers would um, propose a management fee and or combination of management fee and incentive. So how many potential operators are there out there? Um, I'd ask Corey to answer that. I mean, we expect to get at least three or four uh, responses. We've had interest from <coughs> multiple vendors knowing this was going to be coming, but Corey, you might. Uh, well, I asked Corey before specific. the meeting, you know, that, and he said we'd want experience in municipalities. And I said, well, there aren't a lot of municipalities that operate parking garages. So. <laughs> Nationally, I would say there's probably uh, anywhere from five to 20 uh, companies that, that, that could qualify. Um, I, realistically, I'm thinking we'll get about five proposals, maybe six. Um, geographic location is going to be a consideration from some of these private companies. Example, <clears throat> if you're based out of New York and, and you qualify, that geographic distance might be a little cumbersome for that company. So um, we reached out to uh, five organizations that I'm aware of uh, directly, along with um, advertising uh, via Parking Today, uh, national, international parking trade magazine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any questions on the item B? If not, do I have a motion to approve item B? No vote. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, ratification of payroll and vendor claims for the period January 4th through January 24th. Uh, any questions on there by any of the trustees? And if not, then I'd have a motion to ratify. All in favor? Oh, thank you. Uh, next item are financial reports uh, for the six months into December 31st. Uh, I think Jason maybe has got a couple comments. And, and, uh. I do have a few comments I'd like to share. I um, would direct you to page two of your budget to actual report. This is the budget to actual for the Transportation Operations Division. And starting with the revenues, if you'll look at the bottom line under the revenue section, 
we are at about 91% of our estimated revenues. When you compare our budget estimate to uh, where we are in terms of actual revenue received, um, that equates to about a million dollars under where we had expected to be through six months of the fiscal year. Uh, would point out, however, that uh, primarily that shortfall, if you will, in revenue through six months is related to federal grants. And um, I'm pleased to report that we have uh, applied and been awarded our next formula grant. We have um, submitted to the FTA reimbursements for expenses in January, totaling over $1.6 million. So we should hopefully see that federal revenue on our January financial, um, which would be presented in the, at the meeting next month. So um, really, in essence, it's a timing thing of receiving the grant and getting the reimbursement um, so that we can get caught up with the budget. Um, looking at the operating expenditures, um, we continue to maintain expenses uh, less than what was budgeted. Uh, very little change from the last month. If you actually just look at comparing the percent of actual expenses to budget, uh, most of our savings continues to be in personal services, and that's derived primarily from the fact that we started the fiscal year with a lot of vacancies. Um, if you look down our total expenditures, um, we're actually about 959000 under what we had projected through six months of the fiscal year. So um, when you look at uh, total operating revenues versus total operating expenditures, you do see a deficit there where expenses have exceeded revenues by right at a million dollars. But again, with the federal reimbursement revenue that we anticipate receiving, um, we should be back to the back to the positive on that during, when we review our next uh, budget to actual. Um, on page three, you can look at the uh, parking operations. And again, um, if you look at uh, total operating revenue, we're about 220,000 under what we had projected through six months of the fiscal year. You can see most of that is derived from monthly contract revenue and event revenue coming in under budget. Um, at the same time, looking at operating expenditures, although our revenues are coming in under budget, we've, we've also been able to maintain our operating expenditures being under budget. So you can see we're about 180000 less in expenditures than what we had projected through six months of the fiscal year. So even though we are seeing some declines in revenue, it is coming in under budget overall. If you look at the um, operating income, the revenues for the parking system exceed expenses by about $2.1 million through six months of the fiscal year. So um, we're still uh, doing, doing well uh, on the parking operations. Um, next page in your financial is the uh, river cruises operation. And the total operating uh, revenues uh, and expenditures when you compare budget to actual are virtually unchanged from um, last month, and that's not surprising because we haven't been running service. We did not run service in December, so not a lot of new information to report there. I did want to mention, though, that we had our uh, kind of our season-end conference call with HMS yesterday, and um, I know you, we've heard Jeannie speak about uh, this year's uh, river activity and how we've really seen some record ridership, and so, again, um, Appreciate everything Jeannie and, and Joe and with HMS and his crew have done in terms of promoting and managing the river operations this year. I did think it was interesting when we looked at the season ending uh, passenger activity, revenues and budget, just to kind of give you a sense, we, we finished with uh, 13,000 passenger trips that were considered transit passenger trips. That's about a 27% increase from the previous year. Um, Non-transit revenue, in other words, revenue generated from charters and some of the other specialty cruises was up 35% or 26,000 um, over, and um, all within basically the same budget amount. So again, we think we had a really good season on the Oklahoma River. And then finishing up, looking at the uh, bike share operations, um, again, not a lot of changes from what you saw last month. Um, operating income, I'll mention, um, the revenues exceed the expenditures by $65,000 through six months of the fiscal year. But I would also point out that the payment we received from the general fund 
for the bike share operation, you'll notice we've basically transferred all of that revenue. So as we get further on through the year, that operating income surplus will begin to decline. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions about the financials. Any questions? If not, then I have a motion to approve our financials. So moved. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, our program reports, uh, we're going to have three, three reports. First one is transit system report. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees, Mr. City Manager, good morning. Thanks for having us. I'd like to touch on four topics of the December 2016 transit report, safety, ridership, on-time performance, and how we measure up to our fiscal year-to-date report card. We were responsible in December for one low-dollar preventable accident where we were traversing a uh, construction zone in the street and our tire nicked the tooth of a backhoe, causing $652 worth of damage. We experienced three non-preventable accidents during the month of December. If you take a quick look at the ridership, You'll see that we declined from, um, sorry, we declined from 10,788 to 10,099 uh, month or year over year. A part of that was due to the fact that it was December and we had four bad weather days. And I think you remember a couple of them, one in particular where the ice was going to be coming. And I'll tell you that. I rode the buses on both those days to kind of see how the conditions were, and we could have gotten around in a van on many of our uh, ridership was so low. The good thing is that we had no accidents during those times, and one of them was record cold. The other thing about December was it was a little odd in that, that Christmas was on a Sunday. So we were down 6.4% year over year, which um, is still less than um, where our 13 peer cities were uh, during that month. Uh, I'll tell you the total ridership was, year, or fiscal year to date was 1623176 I mean, compared to that, it was 1573 which is a decrease of 2.9%. New night service, and as you can see, historically, we have declined from September through December, where we'll climb out of it in January. I can tell you that um, or the decrease was an 11.1% decrease. And noteworthy, and it's a little odd, is that the two major routes, the 5 and the 23, were down 17% each, and the two minor routes were relatively, they were the same as they were the previous month. On-time performance, which is the, aside from safety, the most important thing to our customers, I'm very, very pleased at the, at the results and the efforts of our people coming together where we delivered 72.5%, which is a 14% increase over the previous year. Now, more importantly, it is a, the result of a concerted effort. It wasn't a flash in the pan in terms of the last three months with the just diligent work of our supervisors and our operators. Um, we increased month over month by an average of 3.6%, which is a huge source of pride for our for our. Um, employees as they deliver, you know, on-time performance to uh, their customers and, you know, live up to our commitment of providing good service. Our year-to-date report card, I'm just going to report, if you don't mind, the uh, percentages. The number of passengers per service hours were at 90 percent. The number of passengers per operating day were at 96 percent. The number of on-time bus arrivals were at 91 percent number of miles between road calls were at 90 percent. Number of vehicle accidents, and this is uh, good performance, were at 68 percent of our goal. And the number of passenger claims per 100,000 miles were at 52 percent of our goal. Um, I'd like to just quickly, before I ask if there are any questions, is to tell you just how my hat is off to Richard Bishop, who was just, a, 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 just dealt with so many different things and put in so many hours and had been here and was the heart of the operation. I think that he was referred to as the quarterback. Absolutely, and that's a very, very difficult job. It's like stepping into the breach every day. The other thing I'd like to mention is that we're just so pleased, I personally am pleased, 
that Chris is the uh, president of the union. He's found himself to be, or I've found him to have sound judgment and to be very fair. And we're already working, and I just am so pleased that he is the fellow that is in charge of the union. With that, uh, any questions, or may I provide additional uh, information? Any questions? All right. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, streetcar report. Good morning. Morning. Give you a quick update on the streetcar program. There we go. All right. <laughs> Um, so operations-wise, um, Embark and the consultants continue to negotiate with Herzog to get the contract finalized. Um, we recently had an in-person meeting January 24th and 25th, and then we had a follow-up uh, conference call with Herzog January 31st. Uh, Embark continues to work with the state oversight authorities. We had ODOT in our office Tuesday, had a great meeting with them, <clears throat> we're able to exchange ideas and continue the process of helping them set up their uh, state oversight authority. Uh, staff and Jenkins, Austin Jenkins, recently went to Dallas and visited their, their program there. A couple of the things that they discussed while they were there were the um, uh, possible streetcar storage and also a parts consortium for Brookville Parts. Um, what that is is where the authorities that have Brookville streetcars they all buy into buying long lead item parts. Brookville stores them, and then if uh, someone needs a long lead item part, they purchase it or order it from Brookville and then replenish that part. Uh, so help with maintenance time and getting cars back out on the street. Um, the past two days I've been in Denver. We visited the RTD system. Uh, one of the interesting things about the RTD system is they have a $2 million um, testing area where you can actually, it's like a simulator, you can actually set behind a, a real life dashboard of, it's actually a commuter rail there. Um, one of the awesome things about it is you, you get a newfound respect for the operators. It's like sitting behind a, a spaceship dashboard. That's very intimidating, I'll say that. So newfound respect for those guys. Um, what I'd like to do on the next couple of slides is kind of walk you through um, the streetcar platform. That's what you'll see on the picture up there. We recently went out to uh, 8th and Broadway and painted out the streetcar stop, which would allow us to physically go out and see the size of it and walk through the, the features of the stop. Let's see if I can control this thing here. Okay, so this first one here, <clears throat> the yellow line shows the uh, new curb line. So the streetcar will be coming from the south, heading north. It'll pull up right next to the curb line. Uh, the blue area to the left of your screen is uh, an area for buses. So that if a streetcar goes down, we can supplement the service with a bus. Uh, that allows, it's the six inch curb height there, which will allow boarding onto the front end of the bus. <laughs> it's very sensitive, I promise, not just me. Be better out there. Yeah. Okay, so this next slide shows the um, ramp up areas that lead up to the level boarding area for the streetcar. So these have all of our ADA slopes, cross slopes that lead up to the level platform area. Um, next slide, thanks. In this area, the blue, blue area in the middle, that shows our 14 inch curb height that allows level boarding onto the streetcar for ADA accessibility and uh, also being able to load your bike on the streetcar so you can just roll right off the curb. There's about a, a two inch gap between the curb and the streetcar, which, you know, that way no one gets caught in the gap. Next slide. On the back side of the platform, there'll be a, a leaning rail, mainly because of, so that people don't step off of that 14 inch curb height on the back side, and also to allow people to stage for the streetcar and have a place to lean against kind of pinkish red object there. That's uh, the location of the platform pylon. The thinking behind that is that we'll have uh, one static display and one uh, TV monitor for uh, information of the next streetcar arrival and also uh, information of things happening in the, in the area. The green 
object there is the ticket vending machine. The thinking behind this is that they'll be similar to a parking uh, parking meter, like the parking on meters that you see out, out front here. So it'll be small, condensed, and uh, provide you with your ticket. The blue object there is the platform shelter. Uh, they're typical 10-foot wide platform shelters, similar to the bus stop shelters. Uh, they'll have a bench inside also for, for sitting, and then next to the bench they'll have a three-foot three, three foot, uh, clear space area for handicapped wheelchairs to be able to get in out of the elements. Then this slide here shows how the streetcar comes in. Uh, to the left there is car A, which will be the front of the car. In the center is the center car where people offload and onload on the level boarding area, and then car B will be the backside, uh, allowing if the streetcar, whenever it gets to the end of the route and needs to turn around, the operator can just walk to the other end of the car, switch everything over and go. All right. uh, give you an update on construction. So utility construction began uh, January 17th. They set up road closure all days the 17th, and then uh, when they broke ground on the 18th, they found a water line that was at uh, a different, different height than they expected. Uh, during design, we actually went out and potholed all of the utility lines, which is where you actually dig down, physically locate the line, give it a size and a depth. Uh, what appears has happened was a one was transposed in front of the three, so instead of uh, us thinking that the line was at 13 foot six, which is what was shown in the plans, it was actually three foot six. So the six inch line had to be relocated. So. They, uh, they pulled all the bags off the parking meters, took down all the traffic closures so they get traffic going back on Sheridan. Uh, design team jumped on it, started making the relocation plans, running it through the utility department, and uh, Herzog moved to Joe Carter Avenue here between California and uh, Sheridan. Um, demolition for, so in this picture here, they're actually starting utility relocations in that area. Uh, demolition for the track slab is set to start in February which corresponds with the mainline construction groundbreaking set for uh, February 7th at 1.30, so next Tuesday. It would be great to have all of you there. Uh, storage and maintenance facility, so kind of similar to the last slide, I put some blue lines up there to help designate uh, the different areas. To the left there, in the picture is the office area, and then moving south is the maintenance office parts, service and inspection bay, uh, heavy maintenance bay, covered wash bay, and covered storage bay. Um, so in the service inspection bay, you can kind of see the forms of the, the walls for the pit area. So the streetcar will be coming from the east, which is, if you look in your picture, you can see Union Station in the background. It'll be coming from the east, traveling west into the storage and maintenance, uh, the service inspection bay. It comes in, and the maintenance men, can, men or women can go down into the maintenance bay, uh, check the trucks, check all the lower stuff, and then also in that service and inspection bay, there's a, a, a mezzanine which allows people to get up on top of the streetcar for the air conditioning systems and the, the uh, pantograph. Uh, in the heavy maintenance bay and the covered wash bay, you can see the notch outs. That's uh, for Herzog Construction to come back and lay, actually lay the track and uh, pour the concrete back for the tracks. We wanted Herzog Construction to lay the track so that they can lay the track coming down Hudson into the yard and into the storage and maintenance facility. So it's one contractor, one uh, warranty contractor, so it's all the same. Um, so construction continues on Map Street storage and maintenance facility. They actually are pouring their last concrete pour uh, right now. So by the end of the day, all of this slab will be uh, finished. And as of right now, the contract completion date is still scheduled, scheduled for October 14th year. Um, give you an update on vehicle procurement. So the shaded out cars have had no physical construction at this time. Uh, vehicle number one in your top left. So on the left side there is car A. It has uh, went through the water testing and has moved into final assembly. Uh, the center car has recently just finalized water testing this week. And then car B is the walls and the roof have been framed and attached, and they are finalizing the framing of the cab. Uh, vehicle number two to the right there, their, uh, car A is in framing. 
center, all three cars are in framing, just different sections of framing. Um, and then vehicle number three, uh, car A is moving into final assembly, and the center car is uh, being skinned, and car B is being framed. And then vehicle four, five, and six are uh, slated to start construction soon. This is a picture of a uh, car A, vehicle one, being water tested. Um, I just thought it'd be a cool slide to see. Uh, the vehicles, as it says, are in the construction phase, and we're expecting our first car uh, June of 2017. And storage options are being evaluated. Like I said earlier, Jason met with DART as a possible storage option down there. Now we're also discussing with Brookville about possibly storing the cars there. And then we're also having plans C and D worked out just in case. Uh, rail procurement, uh, same slide as you've seen the past two times, not actual, uh, much action has taken place. Their uh, rail contractor is scheduled to arrive uh, February 6th, next Monday. They'll do a couple days of testing and then they'll actually uh, begin welding down on 10th Street. And uh, like I told you guys last time, what they do is they take the 57-foot uh, long lean to do flash butt welding, which is where they heat up the rail using electricity, and then they push it together and then knock the slag off. And then they take the 300 foot rails that they have welded together, drag them through town, and then place them into the track slab, uh, tie them up with the reinforcing and then pour concrete around them. Uh, so with that, I'll answer any questions. Oh, and uh, what? And our dedication is next Tuesday, I think. Tuesday at 1.30 uh, in front of Melting Pot on Sheridan. Okay. Groundbreaking. Uh, also, I'd like to extend an invitation. If, if any of you would like to go out and take a look at the platform on 8th and Broadway, we'd be happy to do that. We could do it as a group after this meeting, or you can give me a call and we can do one-on-one -on -one meetings, whatever works best for everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, our last program report is Special Services Transportation Report. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys today? I'm glad to be here and give you a report on what we've been up to in Special Services. Are you? Okay. Um, our paratransit, I'm not sure how much detail you all know about that, but we operate on what's called the demand response model. <clears throat> Basically what that means is that you need to make a reservation in order to use the service. And it does require an eligibility verification process where you actually have to apply. We verify your disability and then a preview for the service so that you can use it. The map that you're looking at here shows the two different zones of service that we have. The green area is what we call our zone one service. Trips in zone one are $3.50 one way. And that is the federally mandated area that we're required to provide paratransit services within three quarters of a mile of our fixed route. The zone two part, the yellow, extends for most of the rest of the metropolitan open city area there. You can see that there's some little pockets of white where there's cities surrounded by Oklahoma City that are not covered. Zone two is seven dollars one way and we um, We like to call our service what we call origin to destination, which basically means that our paratransit operators are trained to provide reasonable amounts of assistance if they have a, a passenger that needs to have some arm assistance to get up to the door or the porch of their house. Um, paratransit is a kind of a unique hybrid of a service, and I'm really pleased to be a part of it. It seems like at least two or three times a month I get a letter from one of our customers telling us about their experience with us, how much they appreciate the service, how it helps them keep their independence and not have to live in a group home or a long-term care facility. Um, go the next one. I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what our ridership is like. Um, this is 2015. I brought you two fiscal years. In 2015, we did 44,370 total trips. And you can see a little bit of seasonality in there. Uh, it tends to slow down a little bit in the wintertime when people don't get out of the house as much. Um, the blue bars that you have on there are trips in Zone 1, and the red is the trips in Zone 2. The Zone 1 was around 39,000, and the remaining 5,300 or so 
were Zone 2 trips. And despite our increasing demand, those trips in Zone 2 are kind of staying steady at about 12% of the total. And this is our full year 2016. And as you can see, we had a 7.9% year-over increase in demand. But the Zone 2, again, stayed steady at about 12% of the total trips that we provide. Um, so far in so far in the current fiscal year through the first six months through December, we've done 25,347 trips. And projecting our average trips per month, we expect to be at 50,000 and possibly even a little bit over. So we continue to increase every year. I thought you might be a little bit interested to know what people use paratransit for. I was, Jason and I were, when we went over the slide together, we were both actually kind of pleasantly surprised about the way it fell out because we weren't expecting there to be quite so much medical and work and educationally related services that we provided. 34% um, of them, people that use it, use it to go to work and school, and about 25% use those to go to the medical appointments, their um, three times a week dialysis, cancer treatments, and things like that. Um, and then, of course, we have the other category where people, we don't, we don't require them to tell us why they're using the services, but we do ask. I kind of wanted to show you this picture because I thought it was a really special thing. The ladies that are alumni of the Oklahoma Guide Dogs for the Blind group um, called us up and asked us back in November if they could come and bring um, lunch to all of our bus operators as an appreciation for all the stuff that they do, both on the fixed route and on the paratransit side, to assist people with disabilities in getting around and meeting their transportation needs. So we kind of wanted to share that feel-good moment with you. We had a really good time. The operators really enjoyed seeing the guide dogs come out. And the, Ladies had a really good time meeting people face to face that they may have talked to on the phone to make a reservation. And last time I gave you a kind of a much more in-depth look into our senior transportation programs. So far in the first six months of the current fiscal year, we've done 18,946 trips. Um, we, we continue to see an increase in demand in the senior transportation. Um, it was really interesting. I um, received some information from the Area-Wide Aging Agency, who is our partner with the grant money to provide this service. And they have done some stakeholder surveys in preparation of updating their comprehensive plan. And so they surveyed stakeholders all throughout the metropolitan area about the needs of seniors in, in this area. And the second ranked priority that they gave for going on now through 2018 was 41% of the people thought you know, making sure that they had reliable transportation so they can maintain their independence and, and kind of age in place at home instead of a, a retirement community or a group home. They, they felt that was the most important thing. Um, we do expect, like I said, the demand to continue to increase. The census data in 2014 showed that about 17.9% of Oklahoma County residents are over the age of 60. In 2015, that it went up to 18.2%, and the long-term projections show that continuing to increase 2 or 3% every year. Um, the other thing, oh, wait a minute, go back one. The other thing that we did in um, December, which was a really nice thing, area-wide does Christmas gift baskets for the senior citizens that participate in their congregate meal programs. And so we put up some flyers to see if we could get our staff interested in it. And we actually managed to raise over $400 of donations and cash that we used to go out and purchase uh, canned goods and personal care items that were packaged up and passed out to the seniors as Christmas presents. And with that, I will take any questions. How many vehicles do we run? Normally. We have 24. Um, we have 16 routes that run on a daily basis, and the others are our backups when they're in repair. Right. Any other questions? Well, I think Thank it's a great you. service that we all don't realize what we do provide at times. So. Thank you. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to receive our program reports? Okay. All in favor? Oh. All right. Uh, any items from the trustees? Councilman? May I ask a question? Uh, Jason, do we, uh, I know we have different pricing for the different garages that we operate. Do we provide any incentives for uh, businesses that buy bulk number of spaces like 40 or 50 or whatever the number is? 
Yes, we have, we have actually a tiered pricing structure. So if we have a large employer, uh -huh. um, let's say, for example, they need 300 spaces, they'll get a better price than, say, an employer that might have 50. Oh, we actually have four different tiers. Well, given the fact that, you know, with the economy changing somewhat quickly the last few years, have we given any consideration to maybe uh, if we have long-term contracts, if the city can enter into long-term space lease contracts, like C for a city year? City can, the copy can. Okay, so like for two years, if you, you know, guarantee to lease however many spaces for two years, we might give those employers an additional incentive just to try to level things out so when, you know, things fluctuate. Plus it gives them assurance once things return to a more active uh, system. And the other question I was going to say or ask is in an, in, in an effort to try to shift some of the demand from some of the locations to others and also combine this to encourage people to use uh, the bus system. If we had like a, a shuttle, I know we have kind of a shuttle now, but one that would focus just on the parking garages and maybe the transit center to not uh, deliver individuals to specific addresses, but have a, a route that would help uh, get those individuals from a more distant location as well as also from the transit center to various parts of the core part of downtown, say not further north than 4th or 5th or 6th Street, maybe 6th Street with the federal building. We should uh, build a modern streetcar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might do it. Well, until that time, yes. uh, maybe we could look uh, just in an effort to try to shift some of the demand and then also make the transit center a little bit more uh, attractive to people who work downtown. Just yes. a thought. Well, we, we actually um, have approached an employer, a large uh, employer downtown, uh -huh. uh, in looking at options for a long-term contract for reasons you've described. It can be beneficial to both parties, particularly in trying to rebalance our parking system. You know, we may not necessarily want to do a long term for a certain garage, other garages, it may make sense to do that. And um, as we continue to look at downtown discovery, op discovery options, for example, we'll certainly incorporate in your suggestion about parking <coughs> garages serving those facilities with that. You know, and I think the greatest demand for something like that, a shuttle that would take you from a more distant parking garage or the transit center if you worked you know, several blocks away is probably the greatest, like from November through February. And then outside of that, I would hope most people would want to just walk to work other than when it's raining or something. Thank you. Have, have you all done, has anybody kind of done an impact study on what they think the BOK, once the building's complete and their parking is, what impact that might have on us, particularly the Arts Center garage? Yeah, we, we haven't done an impact study. Um, our understanding is that when the project was um, initially being considered that the parking would support the tenants of that building. And not Which allow takes for away from us, building. though, Well, sure, I would think. Um, okay. I think the existing tenants, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, 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 can t we can take a look and see well, if we have I any just estimates was curious what, the what, what we feel. Be you know, might, might occur, so. All right. Jim, anything? Surely you have, since you're a guest today, you might have something to say to us. <laughs> no, I, I have to see the progress. Okay. <laughs> All right. Jason, one last thing I know. One, one last thing, and, and it'll be uh, quick, but I uh, was going to ask Michael uh, Scroggins to do a quick uh, update on some uh, items we've been working on to conclude the celebration of COTPA's 50th anniversary. So we've got just a few slides to show you. Well, this has been a very exciting uh, project for us to work on. It's been, uh, definitely takes a little time to do. Uh, we commissioned this as part of our anniversary. 
And what we're going to do is produce uh, later this month, uh, we're in the final stages of producing a gallery book that outlines our transportation and parking history in Oklahoma City uh, since 1887, and we look at each decade after that. Uh, one of the things that, uh, several of the things we've determined is this is very much like a genealogy project in that we were looking at our roots and very, every, every aspect of who we are today was definitely influenced by Classen and Chartel and those founding uh, businessmen of Oklahoma City in the early 1900s. And very much of their policies and their route structures that they have, uh, they established early on, are very present in our system today. So it's, it's been a, a very neat journey to go on. Uh, you know, again, we, there was a semblance of, um, I didn't move, of, of transportation even in 1887. There's records showing uh, of a system that was uh, a horse, a mule-drawn open bus or carriage. And what it did is it, it took people from the far south side of the city to downtown uh, as it developed along the South Canadian River, or the North Canadian River. Uh, later on, uh, you know, the streetcar, that's something uh, that's very pr present in our minds today, was also very present in the minds of those who, uh, who established many of the neighborhoods and communities around Oklahoma City this morning, or this, this uh, in our city. And uh, what we've seen uh, was that there was a, a rapid expansion of that system over the first two decades. Uh, in, in fact, you know, throughout the construction phase, in 1906 it carried about 3.5 million patrons uh, and, and logged over 873 passenger miles, 873,000 passenger miles. Uh, and, and which is odd for any transit system, uh, it actually realized a profit in 1906 of $53,000. Uh, one of the other things, at the height of it, of the, the uh, streetcar era in 1920, it carried, uh, uh, just astounding to me, 20.5 million passengers in 1920. Now keep in mind, you know, during that time, Oklahoma City's population was tripling and doubling every other year or so. So it was just booming, unlike what we might expect or understand today. Uh, very much part of the, uh, I think, the excitement of what the land run and the territory and all the promise that was possible in that early part of our state's history definitely helped drive some of that uh, excitement and, and population growth. Uh, interestingly, though, our bus system, uh, on the right you'll see a, a, a map of one of the early bus system maps. It began in 1927. So they started uh, supplementing streetcar service with buses, with five buses in that year. Uh, we also saw during uh, the decade of the 1930s uh, a sh the parking meter. So that's where we have this introduction of parking definitely into our, our uh, city, the need for parking uh, as the locals are able to afford private vehicles. Uh, so uh, by the 1930s, we saw private auto was increasing, and we also saw uh, that uh, bus service was beginning. Now, in the next slide, we're going to be, uh, we, we look at the decade of the 1940s, a uh, really interesting time due to the war. Uh, one thing I learned that is that the bus service and trolley service was running 24-7, literally. Uh, there was, there's a lot of uh, Oklahoman articles that are discussing that, and that was to help and assist with the wartime efforts because we had so many who were pitching in and helping in factories in different places, uh, and they needed to keep those operations going. So it was critical that transportation was uh, so vibrant and robust during that time. Uh, in 1947, <clears throat> the transit system, by that time it was uh, primarily buses, not as much streetcar, uh, had about 30,000 daily passenger trips. So we were looking today at, you know, a different number, you know, for daily average numbers, but they were looking at 30,000. So still very much uh, used in a different way, I think, back then. Uh, and then during the 1950s, uh, you know, we continue to see bus service improve. You'll see right there on the right with the map, that's the, that's the outline of the, the bus routes. And if you took a look at our street, our uh, system map today, that shape very much looks like the shape that we have today. Uh, so not a lot has changed. And these, again, when they started adding bus service, it replaced existing trolley lines and that service there. It, did, it wasn't doing new things. It was, it was just simply, again, providing service to those areas 
that the, the fathers, who, who uh, I call them fathers, Anton and uh, Klassen and John Chartel, where they developed neighborhoods for all these workers who worked in the downtown area. Um, and then in 1966, it, it came to over several different, uh, uh, for several different reasons. One, it was, it was fledgling as a private organization, uh, and they had this, the city and that organization have very different relationship uh, than what we typically see with public-private partnerships today. Uh, but the city was able to establish us, the Central Oklahoma Transportation Parking Authority, in 1966. And what we uh, saw was that was when the very first federal money was spent on our transit services here in the area. So it, to, it was, you know, John Chartel bought the, the, the uh, franchise rights for the streetcar in 1903. And until 1966, it was pretty much all federally funded, or I mean locally funded. It was, had no federal or state influence uh, from dollars, or so, so to speak. And in fact, all of them were paying franchise fees to the city in order to uh, operate that bus service or transit service uh, that was taking place at the time. So that, and which is what you know, provided a little of the contention between city leaders at the time and uh, the private uh, shareholders of, of this bus company and rail company. Uh, and so then we also take, uh, we'll go on real quick, uh, you know, parking really comes into play in the late 60s and early 70s. This is looking at the Broadway Kerr garage. That was the very first garage that COPPA built. Uh, it was bid out as a package. Uh, uh, the Santa Fe garage and the Broadway curve were bid as a package. The Broadway curve began first. Uh, it was it was very uh, you know. There's a lot of community excitement about this development. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, attention given to uh, uh, the construction cost of the time. It, you know, the astounding cost to build the Broadway Curve at the time was 1.6 million. What we would give to be able to build a garage for 1.6 million, right? Uh, and the Santa Fe garage came in at 4.4 million. So, yeah, at that by 1973, COTPA had 3. Uh, or 3,462 parking spaces. That included those two garages and also the space underneath the Cox Center. So this is just a small taste and a glimpse of the the gallery book that we're producing that includes these facts, some of the historical photos. We feel like it's going to also serve as a way for us to continue uh, this process of archiving and documenting our history, uh, it, as we have definitely shown. It's, there's definitely roots. Uh, that I think we should be proud of and acknowledge, and we're setting some definitely historic moments when we look at February 7th, next Tuesday, with the groundbreaking of the streetcar and reintroducing it to our city. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Michael and Kappa, I want to thank you all for taking the time to do this. Uh, as a research nerd, as a history nerd, as a teacher, um, I mean, this, seeing this, hearing this, I'm a native Oklahoman, and I didn't know 85% of this history. Um, it kind of moves me to tears. Um, and I did, well, I think we ought to. You are right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.